Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, For Your Eyes Only, 2023 CRE Insights in Regions 10 and 11, with the National Association of Realtors Chief Economist, Lawrence Young. We'd like to take this moment to thank and recognize the sponsors of all of our chapters in these regions. It is with their year-round support that we are able to bring you programming just like this, as well as all of the other exceptional events you've come to rely on. We'll begin the session promptly at 4 p.m. Eastern. Hello again, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, For Your Eyes Only, 2023 CRE Insights in Regions 10 and 11. We want to thank you for joining us today, and we want to thank our sponsors. The session will begin promptly at 4 p.m. Hello, and thank you again for joining us. We want to send a special thank you to all of our chapter sponsors. Our webinar, For Your Eyes Only, 2023 CRE Insights in Regions 10 and 11 with the National Association of Realtors Chief Economist, Lawrence Young, is about to begin.
Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Heather Krieger, and I am the incoming president for 2024 of the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware CCIM chapter and the regional research director with Lee and Associates of Eastern and Western Pennsylvania. Welcome to today's webinar for your eyes only 2023 commercial real estate insights in regions 10 and 11, which covers the mid Atlantic up to the New England states. We're happy to share this webinar with everyone in the industry today. For members of the CCIM Institute, this is just one of the many member benefits that are designed to help you adapt and thrive in this year and beyond. Joining us today is the National Association of Realtors Chief Economist, Lawrence Young. He is going to arm you with the knowledge that will help you understand where the economy is and where the commercial real estate markets may be heading in our regions. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We'll be answering as many as we can at the end of the discussion. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please use the chat feature to ask for help with that. The recording and accompanying presentation will be emailed to all registered attendees. Lawrence, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I will turn the show over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Heather. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for inviting me uh, to share some of my thoughts about the commercial real estate uh, to the Region 1011. Uh, it's uh, already winter months, you know, getting ready for the holidays. I actually don't mind the winter cold uh, at all, but what's bothersome is the short light hours. Uh, I know that in Massachusetts, it must be already dark uh, out there. And by the time that I finish this webinar, uh, it will be dark all the way to uh, West Virginia. Uh, but thank you everyone uh, for coming uh, because, you know, the market condition has been difficult. Uh, but we have seen in the past five weeks, mortgage uh, interest rate environment, long-term borrowing rate, uh, turning lower, turning better. And the question is uh, whether this momentum is just the beginning of a long-term rate slide or whether it is just a fluke. Uh, because commercial real estate, as you know, is highly dependent upon the movement of the interest rates. In fact, you can say that the sluggishness of some of the investment activity, commercial real estate investment activity, uh, was attributed to this fast rising interest rate environment. So let's uh, run through the slide uh, and see what we can find. Uh, as you uh, are already aware, uh, the Fed, which is the green line, so that's the Fed policy on the short term interest rate policy uh, has been going from zero interest rate ever since the beginning of COVID. The graph begins from 2019. So you may even say 2019 was a normal year. Uh, and then in the middle, it shows the early years of COVID when the Federal Reserve pursued a zero interest rate policy. The blue line is the prime rate essentially business loan for their most top candidate. Uh, so whatever the Fed borrowing rate is, uh, the banks would just add on some, some percentage point to get that prime rate. Uh, but the aggressive Fed interest rate hike policy over the past 18 months is at a point where uh, for a prime borrower, business loan, they are borrowing uh, at the near 9% interest rate. Now, some loans are tied to 10-year treasury, which is the red line. So the red line do not necessarily follow the Fed rate decision one-to-one, -one, but as you can see, the general movement uh, is upward because the green line, the Fed policy, has been an interest rate hike. So uh, aside from the interest rate hike condition, what we are also finding is that Many of the lenders, especially the small size lender community bank, they have been tightening. So back last year, 2022, middle of last year on construction and land development loan. So that's on the left hand side. Uh, was it tightening lending criteria than before or was it unchanged, just the lending criteria? Uh, and as you can see, uh, very, very few people said they were easing. Uh, half said they were unchanged, other half tightening. But look what has happened this year. More tightening condition, meaning harder to get 
with the same criteria in terms of, say, loan-to-value ratio and such. On the right-hand side is loans secured by commercial building. So the essential movement is the same. So last year, it was leaning towards tightening, roughly half tightening, half unchanged. But this year, uh, almost by two to one ratio, more uh, banks indicating tightening loan condition than before. If we see other interest rates, for example, on the credit card loans, wow, this is above 20%, 23% average. So just imagine some households who are meeting paycheck to paycheck, living paycheck to paycheck, and at times they have to borrow some money, they go to credit card and they are getting wiped away with that high interest rate. The car loans also, which have been at 5% interest rate for most of the past 10 years are now approaching eight, nine percent. So higher interest rate also beginning to do damage to the consumers. Another thing that is boosting the interest rate environment is the large budget deficit that we have been running. So uh, as we all know, we have high budget deficit, last year's deficit, two years ago, three years ago, you combine all the deficit together and that would be a national debt. And the national debt today is at 100% of GDP. If you were to ask an economist just 10 years ago, how would you consider 100% of national debt to GDP? And economists would respond as that is a banana republic finance. But that's where we are. In fact, it's not only America, but many other countries are running into similar situation. So government spending, which is the blue bar, clearly outpacing tax revenue coming in. In fact, you can say 2020, the year of COVID, large budget deficit, great uncertainty, perhaps justified. Well, why is government spending so high now that we are out of the COVID and trying to get back to normal? So clearly unsustainable with more government borrowing that is also pushing up other interest rates. So whatever loan that your client recently obtained maybe two decimal points, three decimal points are added to that uh, because of this large budget deficit. In the meantime, commercial practitioners are uh, taking it on the chin, far fewer transactions, down about 60% fewer transactions now compared to just two years ago uh, because higher interest rate uh, leading to high borrowing costs and people look at the cap rates what the owner is willing to offer. So maybe the owner is saying, okay, we wanna sell the building at 6% cap rate, but from the borrower side, they cannot purchase anything under 7% uh, given the high borrowing costs. So this is leading to a standoff between buyer and seller and consequently very little transaction. In other words, if somehow interest rate was to decline, then they will facilitate some of the transaction that did not occur. Maybe there is some delay transaction, uh, pent up delay transaction that could show up, but that would clearly depend upon interest rates going down. If we look at other metrics, for example, commercial real estate prices, according to Green Street, based on their appraisal values, the red bar is March 2020, pre-COVID, post-COVID divider. So first few months, prices of commercial buildings declined. Then when the interest rates were low, people were bidding up the commercial real estate buildings. So very high, but as you can see, just in line with when the Fed began to raise interest rates, higher interest rate, higher interest rate is bringing down commercial property prices. We know that commercial real estate, the loans are up five years, seven year, 10 year duration. So they need to refinance. So as they are refinancing, interest rates are very high. Furthermore, collateral value is not there as before and make it a very difficult, especially for the community bank uh, who are the source of the commercial real estate loans. So uh, the transaction volume down and also commercial property prices down. This shows the impact of the commercial loans availability between smaller size banks and the top 20 large banks across the country. 
The large banks are the blue line. They have really not changed their lending uh, portfolio for the commercial real estate, but it was the small size bank that has been increasing the availability for commercial real estate loans. That was the source of your business activity. Uh, but now with the commercial prices coming down, uh, the commercial small size banks are essentially uh, feeling some difficulties, balance sheet challenges, uh, and hence, uh, you know, this could lead to some trouble. I hope the Federal Reserve understands some of the difficulty that the small size banks are undergoing, and any raising of the interest rate will put further strain on the small size banks. I emphasize the difference between small size banks and large banks because large banks, in a sense, were helped by the government, while the small size bank not. Large banks have to undergo something called stress test analysis. Essentially, before the rate hikes, the Washington regulators would meet with JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and essentially do a following scenario. What happened to your balance sheet if the interest rates are much higher? And if the large bank's balance sheet is not proper, then they would, the regulators would ask the large bank to readjust their portfolio to be ready for interest rate hikes. Well, the small banks were completely taken by surprise. So large banks were prepared, but the small banks were not prepared for the rate hikes. So the difficulties uh, that you see in the banking system is primarily on the small size bank. They were not given heads up about the rate hike. Uh, and with the large exposure on commercial real estate, any bad condition for small size banks means even greater difficulty of getting that refinanced loan or even just the loan to get the commercial deals. So right now, commercial, uh, the small size bank at a disadvantage compared to large size bank. Let me turn to the economy. On the economy, the latest available information shows solid GDP growth of 5.2%. Anytime you have GDP growth going better than 3%, it will be considered very good. In the middle of the graph shows the lockdown impact, which is actually like minus 30% GDP, and then recovery, the, the reopening of the economy, which was also something like plus 30%, but I have to chop it off uh, just because otherwise other figures will just look invisible. So I just chopped it off at those uh, levels. So there was a big swing during lockdown and reopening of the economy. I mean, some states like New York, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, very difficult to work with the governors delaying, delaying the reopening of the economy uh, while, say, you know, other states were fairly quick in trying to reopen this economy. But uh, especially Pennsylvania, the governor just refused to reopen the economy. So there was further delay uh, in Pennsylvania uh, compared to other states. But nonetheless, right now, we are at a solid GDP number. With exception of, if you look underneath neath the hood of this GDP number, many worrisome signs are developing. What are some worrisome signs? Well, GDP was held up because of consumer spending. Consumer spending remains solid. But as I showed you earlier, some of the borrowing interest rate on credit card, car loans are rising, putting strain on the consumers. There's some question about the student debt uh, where you know not all have been uh, provided and forgiven. Uh, so now there is a, a re, payment of the student debt, which will come eat into consumer spending. Uh, but I put into those three main boxes on key other figures that I'm looking at. First is business spending. We are not seeing any growth in business spending. So whatever business spent last year, they're keeping it the same amount. You may almost, almost say that they're only spending on maintenance and repair and not on any expansion because interest rates are high. The other middle red box is goods inventory. Anytime America produces more cars, more stuff, is counted as GDP. But what the goods inventory is showing is that we are not selling it, but putting it on the shelf, which means that goods inventory contribution to GDP in the future will be negative. It's gonna subtract GDP because you cannot keep adding to the shelf. And the last box is government spending. Uh, right now, there's debate in Senate about you know, funding for 
uh, the foreign uh, wars like in Ukraine, Israel, uh, how much additional to provide. Uh, and also, you know, just overall, large budget deficit, large national debt, how much additional government spending can be there. So we expect uh, those three red boxes to turn a little worrying uh, in the upcoming quarters, essentially meaning that don't expect solid GDP growth anymore. We saw the last one in the recent quarter, upcoming quarter, the numbers would be much lighter. If it turns negative, then we are going into a recessionary condition. Now, related to the job market, job market fortunately remains quite solid. So this is beginning from pre-COVID, and you see the huge knockdown, essentially 20 million job losses, especially in hotel, uh, in restaurants, and when things were shut down. But with each passing month, reopening of the economy, more states reopening it, more job addition, now four and a half million more jobs in America compared to pre-COVID conditions. But the monthly job gains, looking at the delta, not the total jobs, looking at how much additional jobs are coming on, and you can say it is getting lighter and lighter. Could it turn negative in 2024? Well, the trend line is clearly indicating it is a possibility. 2024 is a presidential election year. Uh, so will there be additional uh, stimulus? I know uh, President Biden is trying to forgive more of the student debt, but that just means that moving student debt into national debt. Uh, you know, there's no free lunch. You are just simply moving from student debt over into national debt uh, condition. But the monthly jobs are getting much softer. Uh, and furthermore, job openings, which is red line. How many help wanted signs out there across the country? Well, it's becoming a little lighter and lighter, but it is still the case that there are more job openings than people are searching for job. Blue line shows people without a job and searching. If someone doesn't have a job and not looking for work, they're not in these statistics. So one has to be searching for job. So it is still the case that we have more job openings uh, than people are searching. But look at the gap. Just a couple of years ago, it was a massive labor shortage. Now we still have a labor shortage, but not to the extent that we saw just two years ago. If we look at the unemployment rate, it is still low, under 5%. That is a low unemployment rate, but statistically it is highest in two years. So highest in two years in terms of unemployment rate. And then related to the wage growth, wages are no longer rising strongly. Uh, last year, the wages were rising at 6%, but now it's approaching more like 4%. And this is what the Federal Reserve actually wants to see. They don't want wage pressure leading to companies needing to raise prices to compensate for the wage growth. And also from consumers, even if one is getting a lower wage, if there's low consumer price inflation, their standard of living improves. Just compare last summer, people's wages were rising 6%, 7%. But they went to grocery store, but it was wiped away at the grocery store. And that's not an improvement in standard of living. So we want uh, low inflation and moderate, moderate wage growth uh, to make it much more uh, stable economic uh, condition. So the wage growth is also beginning to slow. Uh, and then if we look at the job market comparison, well, uh, the orange color is not good. New York State they still have not fully recovered from the lockdown. So they lost job. And how are they today compared to pre-COVID record employment? And New York is still down 0.1%. You can say they're essentially even, uh, but they're still not fully recovered. Vermont has not recovered. Rhode Island has not recovered. West Virginia has not recovered. Pennsylvania is showing 2.2%, meaning there is 2.2% more job in Pennsylvania compared to pre-COVID. Uh, New Jersey is one of the better performers, 3.8% in New Jersey. Uh, Massachusetts, big state, 1.9% uh, growth. Uh, but the New England area, uh, you can generally say that you know, anything from West Virginia on uh, towards the New England states, it is underperformer compared to the dark blue states. Florida, doing super well, 9.1% job creation. Texas doing well, 8.8%, 8 
and then you see some Rocky Mountain states. So something about the New England state that's a little sluggish, uh, maybe you know, people need to talk to the governor, just ask them or show this graph, why is, are we underperforming uh, compared to other parts of the country, but uh, state by state comparison across the country. Now, apartment construction is one area where CCIM uh, members have an opportunity because there is a 40 year high for three consecutive years in terms of apartment construction. So whether Northern New Jersey, Boston, apartments are being built and surely they need to be find a buyer. Uh, so maybe CCIM members can help that out. So it is at 40 year high. From economist perspective, my perspective, this is more related to how the rents will perform with so many new units coming onto the market, new empty units. Surely economic logic would suggest that rents should be coming down. Rent growth, apartment rent growth, which have been strong, cannot continue if we have this level of supply situation. And in fact, private sector apartment vacancy rate is showing that this year is much higher than last year and anticipated to be even higher as some of the construction activity get completed next year. So high apartment housing starts uh, will lead to a little bit higher vacancy rate. Nothing alarming, it's just that just a very active apartment construction uh, activity. Um, and the government data looking at all rental units, including single family rentals, one can see the low point was essentially 2022, but now beginning to rise because of active construction. But if we look at the rent condition, how much rent is it rising? One year ago, rents were very strong, 8%, 9% growth. But this year, rents are rising by only 2%. In fact, Charlotte, North Carolina, or Austin, Texas, their rents are actually negative. They have to shave off rents. Is the job market suffering in Austin and Charlotte? No, they're creating jobs. So creation of job means apartment demand, but apartment supply is outpacing demand, so much construction. So it's really supply driven uh, condition where rents are being driven to much calmer condition. But from the Federal Reserve perspective, they are not looking at this data. They are looking at official government data on rent. And according to consumer price inflation component on rents, rents are still rising at 7%, not 1% or 2%. And that's why overall consumer price inflation, which I will show you here, still remains stubbornly high. It's at 3.7%. This is a headline figures. It includes everything, gasoline, food, clothes, university tuition, medical care, everything. But the rent is the heavyweight component to the consumer price inflation. And let me go back to the prior chart. So the prior chart shows that in the blue line, government data is strong, while the private sector data is soft. If we were to use private sector rent data, consumer inflation would actually be under 2%. Federal Reserve target inflation rate is 2%. So if the inflation is 2%, Federal Reserve would feel comfortable cutting rates. But given that Federal Reserve is saying 3.7%, they are continuously announcing, we don't want to cut interest rate. Raising interest rate is still on the table. So this is what the Federal Reserve is indicating based on the official consumer price inflation, which shows strong rents. Maybe there is a lag time between the private sector data and government data. So maybe in six months, government rent data will show something like a private sector rent data, which in that case, say in six months, overall consumer price inflation would be much lower and it would be time to cut interest rates. And in fact, the bond market, not the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve is saying we don't want to cut interest rate. But the bond market is essentially already pivoted, telling the Fed to start cutting interest rate. The labor market is weak. We are seeing a weaker wage growth and the consumer price inflation next year will be much softer. So the bond market has already pivoted. Late October, 10-year Treasury was 
much of the commercial borrowing rate will be determined of the 10 year treasury. And right now uh, it is at 4.1% this morning. So that's like a full one percentage point drop, 100 basis point drop uh, in short duration. In five weeks, the interest rate, the bond market has shifted, uh, telling the Fed clearly to pivot, uh, move it downward. But with 4.1%, and in fact, this graph is actually showing 4.5% 10 year treasury. So you may want to mentally adjust down that blue bar. So blue bar. So a 10 year treasury at 4.1%, which means that implied cap rate, implied cap rate based on historical relation would be at 7.1%. But the red bar shows the current cap rate. Only the office building are matching up with the implied cap rate, meaning that apartment prices may be reasonable. But apart, uh, I mean, office building are reasonable, but apartment buildings are overpriced. Industrials are overpriced. Retails are overpriced. Unless you believe that blue line will continue to decline as the Federal Reserve consider cutting interest rate or cut interest rate next year which in that case, office building becomes a bargain if you believe that the rents can be extracted in the office building. If you believe the rents cannot be extracted, then of course, you know, cap rates on office building would still need to be high. But uh, that blue line, I think, will steadily decline. So perhaps, uh, you know, something like apartment building today overpriced may become neutral price next year. So maybe the buyer and seller uh, do not have to be in that standoff position and transaction could occur. In fact, in terms of the rents, rent growth is the strongest in warehouses, maybe not a surprise. Apartment, again, rent growth is very light because of so much construction. Office, barely positive, while the retail sector is just matching up with consumer price inflation. So your retail client, maybe it's a nail salon owner. So can they charge a little more for their service in line with consumer price inflation? Because the maintenance costs, the heating bill, you know, all that is rising. So the retail rent is only covering some of the uh, rise in the cost of the maintaining the building. Office net leasing. Now, I'm not sure how many of the CCI members are involved in leasing activity. I know you are involved, definitely involved in investment sale, but to the degree that you are also exposed to leasing, there was not that much leasing in office. In fact, I think office has another two or three years of downturn. I am in Washington, DC, and when I walk the street, I would say in any given day, only 20% of office spaces are being utilized, 80% underutilized. It's officially leased, but it's not being leased, I mean, officially not being utilized. So when that lease comes up, I'm not sure how much of a downsizing, uh, say, the companies will do. Uh, so it will be interesting to monitor, but right now, already net leasing in office continue to be negative. Uh, even as we are well past the COVID uh, situation. Uh, and office vacancy rate, uh, I believe, will continue to rise over the next two years. So if you have representing office owner, he's considering, well, do I sell this year, next year? Prices may go down even further two years from now. So maybe you want to advise to say, well, I know prices are lower right now. Maybe it's better to get it uh, unloaded right now uh, rather than uh, two years from now. From the buyer side, negotiate hard, negotiate hard. Get that bargain on the office building uh, if there is some clients who are interested in buying an uh, office building because there is a, a stress, fundamental stress in the office sector. Now, uh, if we look at a specific market, um, Philadelphia has seen that this is Delta, 2.5% increase in uh, vacancy rate compared to pre-COVID condition. Uh, and then as you see, Washington up 3.1%, Boston up 3.6%, uh, New York up 5.0%. How much of the buildings in uh, you know, Manhattan uh, is being underutilized? But good thing that your region do not cover San Francisco. San Francisco is dying. They have seen the hugest, uh, biggest increase in office vacancy rate. You know the reason, dirty, uh, unsafe, uh, you know, people dying of drug overdose. I just don't understand that. Uh, to say you have 1,000 
people in San Francisco dying of drug overdose, it seems like the government just doesn't care. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, if you allow legal sh uh, shoplifting, you know, first it hurts your clients, retail shop owners, uh, but then they have an easy life, then they go to drugs, and before you know it, they're dying away. I mean, this is terrible humanity uh, con condition out there. So uh, sometimes maybe tough love is the best way to you know, get people on the straight path. But the easy love process that San Francisco is doing is just killing, killing the office market, is killing the retail sector market. I'm not sure when this will turn around in San Francisco. Uh, but as you can see, in your region, New York, Boston, uh, Philadelphia, are still seeing increase, but not a dramatic uh, increase. Retail, good thing that is positive. I mean, it's not like bookstore, it's more about service. You know, gymnasium, fitness centers, uh, hair, barbers, nail salons. So this is where the retail services are rising and also the restaurants, you know, restaurant business, especially in the suburbs, not in downtown. People are not coming to downtown. So people are doing more eating and out, uh, out in the suburbs. So retail leasing uh, rising, but as you can see, recent quarter figure is a little lighter compared to what it had been just two years ago. Related to the retail vacancy, you can say that uh, no meaningful change here. Uh, the rents rising according to CPI. So retail is almost like the you know, benchmark. It's not outperforming or underperforming. Uh, it's just being right there in the middle on um, the retail sector. Warehouse. So the, you know, people are still working from home or hybrid model or people have become accustomed to doing easy online clicking shopping. But online shopping is also beginning to uh, weaken. I mean, it's still positive. Leasing activity is still positive, but not as strong as what it was just a couple of years ago. And in fact, warehouse vacancy rates are expected to rise because there is some construction, new construction happening. Nothing alarming in terms of increased uh, vacancy rate. In, in fact, you can say there's more inventory out there for people uh, who are finicky about the right choices, uh, refrigerated uh, warehouses, uh, you know, other uh, requirements. So a little more choices on the inventory uh, warehouse uh, availability. Hotel has fully come back. So hotel industry really suffered in 2020, but they're bouncing back. But the clientele base is a little different. It's not the business travelers anymore. It is more remote workers. So those hybrid workers, so they are saying, you know what? I'm going to spend a uh, you know, weekend over in Philadelphia, and why don't I just uh, stay in the hotel for Monday and Tuesday uh, in Philadelphia, work from the hotel, uh, since I don't have to go back to office every single day. Uh, and consequently, you have a little different profile, individual sort of semi-vacation, remote work uh, condition, which is leading hotel to be back to their uh, normal condition. Uh, uh, condition. Now, the long-term interest rate, again, is important, and my forecast is that it will decline, which means that worse in transaction activity for commercial real estate is coming to an end. If the interest rate fall meaningfully, there will be some increased transaction for the simple fact there are many delayed transactions that will occur in the upcoming years, aside from new investment opportunities. Why? Because rents will come down, that will hold down the CPI, that will force the Fed not only about stopping raising interest rate, but to cut interest rates. I think the Fed will be cutting interest rate uh, next year. The economy is weakening. GDP number was strong, but there are some worrying signs in the GDP along with weakening labor market. And the other point is community banks are really suffering. Community banks really are the source of commercial real estate loans. So when you are trying to get that loan to get that transaction, you are turning towards your local lenders, community banks, but they are suffering. And the way to illustrate is how a Silicon Valley Bank came about. So this is uh, the Silicon Valley Bank situation. So when the interest rates were low, Silicon Valley Bank used people's deposit to buy bonds. Bonds at that time, I, I am leveling old bond, it yielded only 2%. That's before the rate hike. Then Fed aggressively raised interest rates. Remember the big banks were prepared, but not the small banks. So small banks were completely taken by surprise. So if somehow the small banks needed cash, they have to sell their old bonds 
and competing with a new bond and the only way to compete is lower the price dramatically. I think you know about the inverse relationship between interest rate and the bond prices. Well, here it is. So bond prices have really gone down. Uh, but what the Federal Reserve did in light of the Silicon Valley banks collapse is that they put special credit line to the community banks to say that give us your old bond that is really not worth that much, but we will give you $1,000 for it, full value. But in March 2024, in few months, they have to repurchase that old bond that is, has lost value. So community banks will suffer from it unless they renew it. And very interesting that when a question from a reporter to Jay Powell recently asking him, are you going to renew this March 2024 uh, deadline for special credit line? And the answer from Jay Powell was, I didn't think about it. So as they begin to think about it, they clearly need to either cut interest rates or extend. Uh, I think this would be another motivator for the Federal Reserve to cut interest rate. Again, cutting interest rate would be good for commercial real estate uh, investment opportunity. Let me turn towards residential sales. I know you are not doing home sales, but in terms of land acquisition and development. So this is home sales overall. It's on track for possibly the worst year since 2008, or depending on December data, if the green line goes a little below, it could be the worst since 1993. So uh, it's a tough condition. So for realtors, it's been two straight years of tough conditions. But interestingly, home builders are back on their feet. Home sales for home builders are up 4.5%, and it looks like it could be their third best year since 2008. So to the degree that the builders can, and why is that there a difference between existing home and new home? It's because inventory availability. There's simply not enough inventory on the existing home side. People are loving their 3% mortgage rate. They don't wanna give that up. So they are locked in while builders can create inventory. So builders overcoming regulations, overcoming trying to find the subcontractors, lumber prices fluctuating, but once they build it at a profit margin and then they're making the sale. So the builders are back on their feet and, and this is the home price showing the, uh, how much uh, housing shortage we have out there. So Pennsylvania, 41% price increase. Maine, one of the top performers, 65% price increase in the state of Maine. Uh, so there is a housing shortage. So for the commercial members, I think the opportunity is really about housing shortage, land development. Another illustration of housing shortage is this, trailer homes, mobile home construction. Because people cannot buy newly constructed home or the home prices have risen so much, they're priced out. Some people are looking towards mobile homes, but even mobile homes are uh, running into shortage and prices have been uh, driven up quite significantly. So there is a housing shortage. Uh, if you are doing mobile park, renting out some of the spaces, you know, that's a very good opportunity uh, to you know, raise rents uh, condition. Uh, but overall, there is a housing shortage. So to the degree that you can focus on land development or purchase of land where single family builders could potentially buy, I think there's an opportunity there for you. So overall home sales is that in 2023 is the difficult year, but I think it's the bottom. Next year, it will be an improvement. The blue bar is home builders. Home builders have already improved in 2023. They will continue to improve next year. Uh, for the realtors, you know, they will begin to see some improvement as interest rate decline, uh, but the outlook overall for CCIM members, I would say is the following. The Fed, I think, are set to cut interest rate four times, whether they like it or not. Community banks, inflation coming down, weakening job market condition, presidential election year. I think there will be interest rate cuts. Ten-year Treasury today at 4.1%. Already a big improvement from 5% just a few weeks ago, but I think it's going to head a little lower to about 3.5% middle of next year. Improving the cap rate differential conditions, stabilizing commercial real estate prices, except for office. Uh, and then with the economy, uh, with some recovery in the home sales sector, I think this is going to contribute to some modest GDP growth. 
Uh, nothing spectacular, but anytime GDP is positive, that will increase leasing and investment activity and land acquisition, land development. I think uh, there is an opportunity there. So thank you very much for giving me some time to share this idea, uh, outlook on commercial real estate. I know it's been a difficult year, uh, but if the interest rate decline, things will begin to improve for the better. So thank you again. Uh, and now I'm gonna turn it back over to Heather. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions. So for any of the participants on the call, if you wanna uh, type in some questions that you have in the Q&A section down at the bottom of your screen, um, we will look at a couple here. So Lawrence, we have a couple of really good questions. Um, the first one is how does inflation play a role here? Lowering rates next year will stimulate activity in commercial real estate, but also reignites inflation. Um, well, cutting interest rate first, uh, home prices are not part of the consumer price inflation. Uh, it's considered like stock prices or gold prices is considered an asset. So when home prices rise, that's not considered as an inflation It's really about rents and rents are not set to rise given so much supply that's coming onto the market. Uh, and the gasoline prices, fortunately right now, there's a, a increased oil production. Somehow it's happening right before the election. I know the oil production was really jammed, uh, log jammed. People in North Dakota were angry at Biden administration. People in Louisiana uh, were angry at people in Alaska, but now somehow they're producing more oil. So that has dropped the uh, energy prices. So I think that's gonna also help on the inflation front. And then as a clarification, someone asked, did you say that you expect commercial real estate transactions to come to an end? Uh, commercial real estate, uh, the weakness in the commercial real estate transaction this year to be the low point with some pickup occurring uh, next year. So, so that's what I meant that uh, is the ending of the low cycle. So, you know, we know that real estate is cyclical. So this year was a downturn and then next year will be some degree of rebound. The rebound strength will depend upon interest rate conditions. Okay, next one is the special credit line regarding Silicon Valley Bank. Who pays for that? Isn't that just another government bailout and won't that lead to more inflation? Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, so the special credit line is essentially uh, all this. So Silicon Valley is already out and uh, done, but other banks in a similar situation, they're trying to keep it alive. Uh, we don't want to have a banking crisis, uh, but it is something called repo, uh, just repurchase program. Essentially, it's only a temporary program where uh, the community banks have some bad assets, turn those bad assets to the Federal Reserve temporarily, but the community bank has to repurchase that. So you can say that it's only trying to get by some time. It's a timeout period. Uh, so is it a government bailout or not? It's just a timeout period. But way to improve the balance sheet for the community bank is really to cut interest rate so that all bond value begins to recover so that community banks will be in much better situation. Um, and then another question for you. So we've heard a lot about the increase in expenses uh, for properties, particularly when it comes to energy and um, property insurances and things like that. So what are your outlooks on that for next year and how that is going to how that is going to affect the investment market for next year? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been hearing about especially the insurance costs. I mean, the insurance costs renewal rising 20 percent, 30 percent. You know, you own a large apartment and then suddenly you see this bill and you cannot raise the rent on apartment. You are stuck. I mean, those are very difficult situation. Uh, NAR, because, you know, I, I work for NAR. Uh, we are looking at uh, all this uh, it's, people to look into insurance issue. In the past, we only looked at things like wildfire, uh, flood insurance, natural disaster, but there's something else happening uh, aside from that because many buildings not exposed to natural disaster, their insurance rates are rising. Uh, to see uh, what the source of that is, is that lack of competition in the insurance providers market. Uh, but you know we are constantly fighting for, I think what you already know, things like preserving 1031 exchange, uh, you know, trying to uh, knock away any rent control legislation that is out there. But the new issue that NAR are suddenly facing on commercial is on that property insurance, uh, which we've been hearing and hearing. Uh, so uh, we're going to get 
uh, you know, first we want the member input. So we have already the committee set up and then we're going to talk with some experts in the insurance field to see why is this hurt happening and what could be done to address to minimize the increases uh, in insurance. I, I'm not sure if there are any other questions. If anybody has any last minute questions here. Um, but thank you again, Lawrence, for today's presentation. Um, this was really awesome that you came on and shared your expertise with us. Um, as a reminder, this recording and the presentation will be emailed to all the registered attendees for today. And if you're not already a member of the CCIM Institute or course participant, take a moment to sign up for our e-newsletter at ccim.com to stay informed about complimentary webinars like this one as well as other professional development opportunities. Thank you again so much for your time and we appreciate you and have a great day. Thank you.